What can we learn from reflecting on the case studies of Phineas Gage and those included in Oliver Sacks' book titled The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat? To what extent should those suffering from certain mental illnesses and dementia be excused from also suffering from the consequences of their actions? And in particular, why was Phineas Gage arguably the most famous schmuck in history because of the horrific accident he suffered as a railroad worker in 1848? And what is it like to live your life unable to remember recent events or remember who your loved ones are? Why do dementia patients often lash out at baffled bystanders or even at close family members who take care of them? Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. We will end our video with additional reflections on the sources we used in this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare, which includes illustrations. Our sister blog includes footnotes, and both include our Amazon book links. How did I become involved in promoting awareness of dementia patients? I was involved in a controversy where I halted the foreclosure of an over 55 destitute condominium owner who had advanced dementia, who had no close family, and who had fallen behind in his condominium maintenance fees. The foreclosure was halted so the court could appoint a guardian to place him in an appropriate care facility and then pay off his back maintenance fees. Why was everyone so upset? Well, he had been harassing the people in the office and he had an alcoholic girlfriend who moved out after his money ran out, and he had numerous domestic disturbance calls by the police. And there were unconfirmed reports of him waving a gun around at people. His demented behavior was causing his neighbors to be quite upset, like it was his fault. And the concept that someone could be so demented that they're no longer responsible for their behavior is hard for people to accept. After all, the concept that we are all responsible for our actions, that we always act out of free will, is a bedrock principle in our legal and even religious institutions. But unfortunately, as psychologists know, there are many mentally ill who cannot control their actions. One early and famous case history is that of Phineas Gage, who is perhaps the most famous and influential schmuck in human history. I have listened to many psychology lectures in Wondrium, the teaching company and university lectures on YouTube that retell the story of Phineas Gage, which I've heard a dozen times. When my daughter in medical school told me she was starting her psychology section. I told her she would soon hear the remarkable story of Phineas Gage. Our Phineas Gage was working on the railroad one sunny day in September 1848. The gang he was directing had drilled a hole where a metal rod tamping iron was packing the powder and sand into the hole. He was distracted and inadvertently positioned his head over the hole. As he opened his mouth about to speak, a spark ignited the powder, blasting the tamping iron behind his jaw and left eye through his skull. The tamping iron landed 80 feet away, smeared with bits of blood and brain. Remarkably, Phineas Gage never lost consciousness and was not in tremendous pain. He walked without assistance to an ox cart and rode sitting upright to the doctor's office a half an hour away. He was vomiting and regurgitating blood, but the doctor patched him up, and although he had a very lengthy convalescence, he did live, and he never suffered any extreme handicaps. But the tamping iron did take out a big chunk of his cerebral cortex, the region of the brain that scientists have since determined governs our inhibitions. His behavior changed radically. Previously, Phineas Gage was a healthy, punctual, hard-working, conscientious 25-year-old employee who was the best foreman working for the railroad. After the accident, Phineas Gage started cursing, became rude and abrasive to his co-workers, and was unable to follow through on any planned activity. And there were rumors that he started drinking and gambling and was guilty of inappropriate sexual behavior. These behavioral changes, plus the inability to manage your financial affairs, are also a common marker for those who suffer from dementia today. In time, often other portions of the brain can assume the functions of a damaged section. Dr. Wikipedia reports that Phineas Gage may have recovered his ability to control his emotions a few years later. He emigrated to Chile, where he was able to hold a job driving a stagecoach before passing away about a decade after his accident when he was 36. And it is indeed remarkable that he could function somewhat normally after such a devastating trauma to his brain. Now, did that tamping iron take out that part of Phineas Gage that controlled his moral compass? The testimony of his associates and the medical experts of the time would agree. 
although it seems that in time his brain rewired and recovered at least some of this compass. Can dementia rob those with advanced dementia of their moral compass? No, I did not ask, does dementia rob some of their moral compass? Because, unlike the sudden accident of Phineas Gage, dementia is gradual at first and really does not change the personality of the patient, but rather sometimes accentuates their existing personality. Someone who begins with a strong moral compass will likely retain more of their compass as their dementia progresses. But there's a caveat. We must emphasize that many dementia patients do lash out as their dementia progresses, mostly out of frustration and in response to pain and discomfort they experience because they're not eating well or able to take care of themselves, or maybe have a urinary tract infection, including many who would have never struck out before their dementia. The irrational behavior of those suffering from dementia is such a problem that a page on the Alzheimer's website discusses why those with dementia often suffer from aggression and anger and how to deal with it. This means that whenever someone is 70 or older, or sometimes younger, and they lash out inappropriately or behave in a sexually inappropriate manner, even if that has always been a part of their personality, you can never rule out that they're suffering from the early stages of dementia. You just have to show patience towards our elderly citizens and you have to give them a break sometimes. And we always repeat that there's a rare type of dementia that is curable, and that tumors or other metabolic or medical disorders can cause symptoms that mimic dementia. So it is critical that the elderly are seen by doctors and that their doctors be completely informed about all the health challenges they face. And also fill up your grocery bag with their medications to make sure the combinations of drugs are not causing problems. One book that was continually mentioned in the footnotes was Oliver Sacks, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, a remarkable collection of case histories of patients with puzzling, remarkable, and often tragic neural deficits of the brain. Many of his patients were in a home for the aging, but he did not report any cases that were obviously dementia, as they did not seem to have the relatively quick deterioration that dementia patients suffer. But they do illustrate the persistent inability of these patients to control their behavior and their inability to better themselves by simply trying harder, and their persistent helplessness in the face of their mental conditions. One curious story was the case of the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Dr. P was a well-known musician, known as a singer, then as a music teacher, but as he aged, a curious deficit evolved. He lost the ability to recognize faces, but when they began to speak, he could identify them by their voice, and he could converse without difficulty and intelligently. And he did not feel ill, and he was a dazzling singer, and as much as later, Glenn Campbell and Tony Bennett did not lose their ability to perform until very late in the course of their dementia. Now, what was wrong? He first went to an ophthalmologist to check his eyesight, but there was nothing wrong physically, so he was referred to Dr. Sachs, a neurologist. He performed a reflex test where he had to take his shoes off, and afterwards discovered that the patient did not know how to put his shoe back on. And the good doctor had to help him put on his shoe, and then asked him to describe pictures in a National Geographic magazine. He could describe this detail or that, but found that he had lost the ability to describe the landscape as a whole. When the examination was over, Dr. P looked around for his hat. He reached out his hand and took hold of his wife's head, tried to lift it off to put it on. He had apparently mistaken his wife for a hat. His wife looked as if she was used to such things. And later, our good doctor visited his house. Dr. Sachs remembered. On the walls of his apartment were photographs of his family, his colleagues, his pupils, and himself. By and large, he recognized nobody, neither his family, nor his colleagues, nor his pupil, nor even himself. He recognized a portrait of Einstein because he picked up the characteristic hair and mustache. And the same thing happened with one or two other people. Although he could distinguish the stylized pictures of royalty on the playing cards, or maybe he just saw the letters J, Q, K. Also, he could not make sense of what was happening in a movie playing on the television. Dr. P also reported that he could no longer dream pictorially. And his wife said he could only perform daily tasks if he sang while doing them. The visual cortex of his brain suffered damage. His brain could interpret sounds, but not sight. In addition to this case of Dr. P, the music teacher, Dr. Sachs has several case histories where music can stimulate many who suffer from neural deficits. Dr. Sachs states that even the profoundly retarded can seemingly come alive when exposed to music. And he writes, their uncouth movements may disappear in a moment with music and dancing. Suddenly with music, they know how to move. We see how the retarded, unable to perform fairly simple tasks, involving perhaps four or five movements of procedures in sequence, can do these perfectly if they work to music. What we see fundamentally is the power of music to organize, and to do this efficaciously, as well as joyfully, when abstract or schematic forms of organization fail. 
In our review of books about Alzheimer's, the best case study we found is that of the biography of Glenn Campbell's latter life by his fourth wife and widow, Kim, which shows both how his personality slowly transitioned into dementia and how music and his musical performances appeared to slow his descent into advanced dementia. Both Glenn Campbell and Tony Bennett had a final performance, sharing with the audience that they were indeed suffering from Alzheimer's. Tony Bennett's last performance included duets with Lady Gaga, who was his New York neighbor and often visited his studio to practice their duets. Both these musicians had little difficulty performing their old songs with panache, but had great difficulty performing new songs, though a teleprompter helped some. Likewise, Rita Hayworth also continued her acting career throughout the early stages of her Alzheimer's, and her performance helped her dementia to subside, though she found it increasingly difficult to remember her lines. And Dr. Sachs has a touching story about Rebecca, who was profoundly retarded from birth, unable to walk around the block, clothed herself with difficulty, and was unable to unlock her door with a key. And the rituals and candles and bowing in her Orthodox Jewish services brought her comfort, but she did not perform well in the workshops and odd jobs that were intended to give her focus. But she loved to perform in a special theater group. Dr. Sachs remembers. She loved the theater group. It composed her. She did amazingly well. She became a complete person, poised, fluent, with style in each role. If you saw Rebecca on the stage, for this theater group became her life, one would never even guess that she was mentally defective. And he concludes, we pay far too much attention to the defects of our patients, as Rebecca was the first to tell me, and far too little to what was intact or preserved. And the same concept that rather than trying to improve dementia patients in a foolish attempt to make them normal again, we should rather seek to encourage and enhance those joyous activities and capabilities they have remaining. And this is a theme in the video inspired by the wonderful book by Joanne Koenig Costi, Learning to Speak Alzheimer's. She not only cared for her husband who suffered from early onset dementia, but also cared for many dementia patients in a facility for many years after his death. Now, Jimmy G was admitted to the nursing home where Dr. Sachs was in attendance in 1975. He had a severe case of retrograde amnesia. Jimmy remembered his wartime experiences like they were yesterday. He enlisted in the Navy when he was 17 in 1943. And by 1945, America had just won the war. FDR had died at Warm Springs and Harry Truman was giving the Russians hell. When Dr. Sachs first examined him, our good doctor made the mistake of showing Jimmy his face in the mirror. He panicked. Who was that gray-haired man? He knew he was all of 19 years old. Jimmy was looking forward to attending college on the GI Bill, and he was proud of his older brother, who was studying accounting and would soon get married. Dr. Sachs obtained his records from the Navy. He was discharged in 1965, but found his way to Bellevue Mental Hospital in 1971, where his heavy drinking and cirrhosis of the liver led to diagnosis of advanced organic brain syndrome. He was dumped in a substandard nursing home until he was transferred to Dr. Sachs' nursing home. Jimmy could converse in witty conversation. He could play a good game of checkers, but he did not have the attention span for chess, but he performed well on cognition tests. They contacted his brother. They discovered they had not been in contact for 30 years. His brother said his drinking became uncontrollable after he retired from the Navy. They convinced him to visit Jiminy in the hospital, but that only made him angry. In a deep sense, he recognized his brother, but he was so angry. He was this strange, unsettling 50-year-old man. His real brother was only 21. Was this amnesia caused by his drinking? Or did he drink to crowd out his creeping amnesia? Or did they feed on each other? And we learned that Rita Hayworth also was drinking heavily in her early years of dementia. We can ask the same question of her. Did her drinking worsen her dementia? Or did she drink because of her dementia? Or both? Dr. Sachs does say that on rare occasions, heavy drinking can contribute to amnesia. Jimmy, like many with dementia, only remembers the past. He remembers nothing of recent experiences. Now, unlike dementia patients, his condition did not deteriorate rapidly. He could cope in the hospital from day to day. Although, like some dementia patients, seeing his image in a mirror upset him, is a cause of conflict between his self-image in his mind and his actual appearance. Dr. Sachs describes another case of another frenetic patient who had no short-term memory whatsoever, forgetting names and people. He remembered that Mr. Thompson would identify me, misidentify, pseudo-identify me as a dozen different people in the course of five minutes. He would whirl fluently from one guess, one hypothesis, one belief to the next, without any appearance of uncertainty. 
He never knew who I was or what and where he was, an ex-grocer with severe Korsakov's disease in a neurological institution. And he told amazing personal stories full of fantastic adventures. We also reviewed an even more enlightening collection of case histories of both dementia patients and their caretakers, which helps alleviate the guilt many caregivers feel when they react negatively to the dementia displayed by their loved ones. And caregivers are discouraged when their efforts are not appreciated by the loved ones they care for because their dementia has either robbed them of the compassion they once felt or made their remaining compassion fleeting and fickle. Many police departments, particularly in my state, Florida, have CIT police training programs through NAMI which cover mental illness. But currently, these only cover autism, drug abuse issues, and mental health issues with younger offenders. But we do know that there are discussions between the Alzheimer's Association, NAMI, and the police departments locally to address this training issue, and perhaps nationally as well. And now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Oliver Sacks' wonderful book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, is one of those rare books that both clinicians and laymen can benefit from reading and is cited by many other books and studies. And there is a 100-page book that further analyzes these case histories, and that itself has close to 5,000 citations. The review states that Dr. Sachs found it puzzling why so many doctors preferred an impersonal approach to their patients. His ideas were so influential that they heralded the arrival of a broader movement, narrative medicine, that placed stronger emphasis on listening to and incorporating patients' experiences and insights into their care. And the original copyright was in 1970, and it parallels the anti-psychiatry movement that sought to humanize the mentally ill patient and give him as much agency as possible. And this book has 24 case studies that have fascinated clinicians. They include a case where the patient cannot recognize anything on the left side of her body, or even in the left side of her plate at mealtime, and a patient whose drug use caused an extremely heightened sense of smell, and an autistic artist who could draw amazingly expressive illustrations with just a little bit of encouragement. He explored patients with Tourette's syndrome, which is characterized by an excess of nervous energy, with strange motions and notions, tics, jerks, mannerisms, grimaces, noises, curses, involuntary imitations, and compulsions of all sorts. He examined several cases of Parkinson's, a gradual neurological disease. And with Parkinson's, patients first experience tremors and difficulty walking. And as the disease slowly progresses, symptoms of dementia manifest. In one case, a patient leaned a good 20 degrees when he walked. We have learned in our studies that sometimes a brain tumor can cause dementia-like symptoms. And if the tumor can be removed, the dementia dissipates. Oliver Sacks explored several cases of patients severing brain tumors. Sometimes they cause changes in behavior, such as one droll chemist who became funny, impulsive, and superficial. An Indian patient had a malignant brain tumor that could not be removed. Her tumor caused vivid, technicolor memories of the Indian landscape, villages, homes, and gardens from her childhood. As death approached, these pleasant memories flooded over her, and they lasted most of the day. And he examined cases where strokes also caused hallucinations as in the case of an Irish lady whose stroke triggered songs she had heard in her childhood. Oliver Sacks also ponders the visions of the influential Hildegard of Bingen, the mystic who so profoundly influenced medieval Catholicism. He reproduces many of these visions, saying they indisputably resemble hallucinations caused by visual auras of migraines. Hildegard herself writes, The visions which I saw beheld neither in sleep, nor with my carnal eyes, nor with the eyes of the flesh, nor in hidden places. But wakeful, alert, and with the eyes of the spirit and the inward ears, I perceive them in open view and according to the will of God. I have never fallen prey to ecstasies in these visions, but I see them wide awake, day and night. This scientific observation should not damage the faith of anyone. For when God does bless a saint with visions, it would make sense that he would then cause their senses to perceive those visions. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the Meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.